Well, I felt like the Lord spoke to me to speak on the potter's will from Jeremiah chapter 18 and also touch on chapter 19 a little bit. But to begin with, a few weeks ago, I put a poem in the bulletin. It was written by Nita Heigert uh, back in February of 1984. So I want to start off by reading this poem. Nita, you won't faint if you just wave your hand, will you? Okay. Other than that, she said she would faint if she had to read this, so I'll read it for her. It's called The Potter's Wheel. The potter's wheel spins endlessly day and night, waiting, waiting for a piece of unmolded clay. The process is slow and painful at times, but shaped with hands that are so gentle, loving, and kind. Be careful not to stop at will the process taking place on the potter's wheel. Precious is the shape taking place each day of the soon-to-be vessel of unmolded clay. No two the same shape, no two the same in shape, size, and form, just as the beauty and decorations it will adorn. The fire that may feel far too intense is more important than time on the potter's wheel spent. Tis the fire that sets and seals the vessel for use, the chance of breakage this same fire will reduce. When we give our all to Jesus, the process will be the same, the potter's wheel, the fire, if shape and decorations we expect to gain. Stay on the potter's wheel and hands so gentle, loving, and kind. Go willingly through the fire. It is only for a time. When through it all we will be purified as gold, a vessel fit for use, the potter will behold. It's a beautiful poem, Nita. I think most of us are familiar with this imagery of a potter shaping clay as it spins on a wheel. When we do get to Jeremiah 18, the, uh, the Hebrew here in the verses indicates that what we're talking about is a two-stoned apparatus. What you have is you have two flat stones, a bigger stone on the bottom and a smaller stone on top, and in between there's a vertical post. And the larger, heavier stone is on the bottom, which creates balance and momentum. And the potter, because this is before electricity, he would turn that uh, wheel with his feet, that larger wheel with his feet, and then the smaller wheel would be on top, and that's where he would paste a lump of clay and begin to uh, shape it. So God loves to use imagery from everyday life to communicate things to us, and that's what he's doing here, because in that culture, it was a very common thing for them to take clay and to create something out of it. And so God is communicating in a way that they would understand because pottery was everywhere in the ancient world. They would take... Uh, clay tiles for their roof, and they would fire up bricks for their ovens, and they would make clay figurines for decorations or toys, and we know that they would make clay pots for storage and cooking and, and drinking. So the potter was a very important craftsman in that community. Now it's more of a kind of a hobby kind of a thing, but back then it was a critical craft, and that person would be esteemed. And so this imagery, they all were familiar with how these things were made, this imagery would, would help people understand what God was saying to them, and it would also serve to remind them in the future of the message that Jeremiah is giving. Whenever they saw a pot, it would be kind of like a connection. They would re remember the words of the prophet. So Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house. There I will reveal my words to you. So Jeremiah says, I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working away at the wheel. But the jar that he was making from the clay seemed flawed in the potter's hand. So he made it into another jar, as it seemed right for him to do. So as Jeremiah is watching, the potter determines there's something wrong with the piece of clay that's on the wheel, so he reworks it into something else. Now who is the potter? The potter is, is God. And who is the clay? Well, contextually, the clay is Judah, but it's ultimately us. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. This is what the Bible says. Yet, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands, O Lord. So who is the one who shapes the clay? Who is the one that molds the clay? Who is the one that determines what the clay vessel will ultimately be? Who? Who? It's God. The clay has no power to mold itself. That lump of clay on the wheel has no power to mold itself. It simply must be submitted to the potter. 
And the potter is going to mold that clay according to his will, what the potter decides that clay should look like. The clay's job is to submit, to yield, to not resist, but to just allow the hands of the potter to shape it. These are simple analogies, but these are powerful spiritual truths because God said, I am the potter and you are the clay. 2 Timothy 2, 20-21, this is what the Bible says. In a large house there are not only gold and silver bowls, but also those of wood and earthenware, some for special use, some for ordinary. So if anybody purifies himself from these things, he will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And then the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not for us. So I hope we can see that every person here is a vessel in the hands of God. We are all vessels in the hands of God. The purpose and the destiny of our lives is to be formed and determined by who? God. And this happens as we yield to God. God does not have this sort of Hollywood imagery that we have had foisted on us most of our lives, where by your own determination and grit, you pull yourself up from the ashes, and you're an island, and you can just like do everything and take care of everything on your own, and you don't have to be emotional. You're just, you're just a man. But that's not what God says. I want us to listen to this very beautiful passage of Scripture out of Psalms 139, verses 13 through 16. We're familiar with this passage of Scripture, but with the truth that I've been speaking, I'm just speaking biblical truth, and I just want you to read this, understanding this. The Bible says, You created my inmost being. God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Can, can we say this together? I am a work of God. Can you say, I am wonderful? The Bible says you're wonderful. I know that full well. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Can you kind of see the imagery? The clay is not quite formed yet. God saw you when you were just a lump of clay. All the days ordained for me, God says, were written in your book before one of them came to be. Whose hands are you in right now? You're in God's hands right now. It's important for us to see that God created each and every one of us the way that He wanted us to be. This is probably one of the things that we probably, most of us, never get settled. If I was to ask the question, how many people have body image issues? Just as many men would raise their hands as women. We, everybody has body image issues. Everybody, everybody has issues with kind of how they are created or, you know, I would, I would be able to tell you, you know, you think this or you think, you know, this about your body or how you sing or, or who you are. But God created each one of us the way that he wanted us to be. Psalm 100 This is what the Bible says in Psalm 100. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. God is the one that put your DNA together. God is the one that gave you breath and life. God is the one that formed you and made you. And God is the one who still holds you in the palm of His hands. We are to accept who God has made us. We're to accept what God has made in the totality of our existence, and we're to do the best we can with how He made us. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, whatever vessel or instrument God has made you, we need to do the best we can to just flow with that and accept who God made you. You are to accept, this is the body that God has given me. These are the brains that God has given me. This is the situation that God has placed me in, and you're to flow with that the best you can. And, and this is not some sort of um, situation where it's um, fatalism. That's the word I'm looking for, where it's just like, oh, well. 
Because I'm going to show you in a few minutes that God gives us a lot of power to determine how these things work out. But I also want to say that He has set you in motion. He has given you life. He has breathed into you. He has made you who you are. And He cherishes you and loves you just the way that you are. We see through human eyes, but He sees through eyes of love. And He sees beauty and He sees a creation that He desires. That's how God sees you. It's not for us to complain. It's not for us to compare ourselves with other people. It's not for us to moan or resist. But we need to take what God has given us and we need to use it the best for His glory. Amen? Now what is also being shown here is that indeed God really is sovereign. And when I say God is sovereign, that means God is in ultimate control. And I want to distinguish, that doesn't mean God is responsible for the things that that, that people do, but He is in ultimate control of everything that goes on. What goes on, He may allow things to work themselves out, or He may allow people's decisions and the consequences of those decisions to, 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 to come to completion. Maybe even the consequences of somebody else's decision affects you. He allows those things, but He is ultimately in control because he holds everything together by the power of his word. So it says in Jeremiah 18, 5 and 6, The word of the Lord came to me, House of Israel, can I not treat you as this potter treats his clay? This is the Lord's declaration. Just like clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. Romans chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, but who are you? Anybody that talks back to God. What? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over his clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? So again, it is the potter who determines what he will shape the clay into. Only God truly has the power to shape our lives and guide our lives. Our job, again, submit to the process. That's why it's so important that we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will speak to us and we will allow Him to shape our lives. We need to allow God to do what God needs to do in our lives. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says this, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath preordained that we should walk in. So if God wants you to be in the band, he's going to create a flute or he's going to create a trumpet or he's going to create something. He says, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to form you to be able to do that. And then this is what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Okay, I'm going to form you into a clarinet, being confident in this very thing. He's not going to just leave you this long tube with no little things to manipulate. He who began a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he is going to craft you into that flute and he's going to pierce those holes and then ultimately by his spirit he's going to teach you how to read music and then he's going to place music before you and then he's going to put breath in your lungs so that you can blow that flute and he's going to guide you so that he will be able to direct you throughout the course of your life to bring him glory. Continue reading. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8, uh, let me see, 12. At one moment, God says, I might announce concerning a nation or kingdom that I will uproot, tear down, and destroy it. However, if that nation I've made an announcement about turns from its evil, I will relent from the disaster I had planned to do it. At another time, I will announce that I will build and plant a nation or kingdom. However, if it does what is evil in my sight by not listening to my voice, I will relent concerning the good I had said I would do to it. So now say to the men of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord God says. I'm about to bring harm to you and make plans against you. Please, God says, turn now, each from your evil way. Correct your ways and your deeds. But they will say, it's hopeless. We will continue to follow our plans, and each of us will continue to act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. In his sovereignty, what is happening here is God is giving his people freedom to decide whether or not they're going to cooperate with him. He's given them freedom. He's saying, you can go with me, or you can go against me. And he tells them what the results are going to be. So both these verses are offering incredible hope, but they're also offering a very stern warning. See, the destiny of nations and peoples is not set in stone. Now, I believe with Israel, God has made a covenant with them. 
It's just going to happen, okay? But what I'm saying is, if a nation or a person is evil or they're unsaved, they're headed for judgment, they're headed for destruction, but according to God's Word, if that nation or those people repent and they choose to turn away from their evil and they choose to turn back from God, God says, I will show mercy. That's hope. God says there's always hope. Doesn't matter how bad somebody is. If they will repent, obey His Word, God will show mercy. But if a nation or people that God wants to bless, like God wants to bless the United States of America, if though that nation chooses to do evil, then God will change His decision from blessing them, and He will allow them to reap judgment. That's the warning. He's saying if you choose to go this way, this is what is going to happen to you. Jeremiah 18, 11. I put them in a couple different versions. Jeremiah 18, 11. The Bible says this. Got them? Okay. Now therefore, say to the men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and deeds. Got the other version? Okay. That's fine right there. I am shaping is the word. Now, we got to remember, they weren't reading this, they were hearing this. And they were hearing this in Hebrew. So I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but the word for, uh, for shaping here is yosher. And it's the same root word as potter. So what's happening here is, God is using these words to connect the person that's hearing this back to the image of potter. So when they heard that, they would think he's shaping like a potter shapes God is shaping disaster for Judah because they will not repent. In other words, contextually, God is the potter, and He is going to allow Judah to be remolded or reshaped by allowing them to go into exile because they're unrepentant, they're not submitted. Verse 4, read, look at this. This is the New Living Translation, Jeremiah 18.4. The jar that he was making did not turn out as he had hoped, so guess what? He crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. God is going to allow them to be crushed by the Babylonians and then He's going to start over. That's what's going to happen to them because they're unrepentant. It doesn't have to be this way. God is saying, if you ever have this image of God being hateful or mean, you're just not reading the Bible, okay? He is merciful to the very end. He does not desire anybody to perish. But I will say this until I die. Sin has its own reward. You don't have to determine, well, is God disciplining or is God judging or this or that or the other? The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. So when you sin, those seeds of destruction are in that sin. God doesn't have to do anything. If you decide to live in sin... Sin itself has the power to bring destruction into your life. I don't care if you're saved or unsaved. It has the power because the wages of sin is death. It doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven. You'll be forgiven, but you will reap destruction if you continue in sin. God can step back. and He hasn't, You don't have to go through all that. God discipline, God judging. You don't have to. It's just this is the consequence of bad decisions and bad behavior. It happens to the good and it happens to the bad. It doesn't matter. It's indiscriminatory. It doesn't matter. Sin is its own reward. So Israel does not have to go down this path. They can act in such a way that God will turn from allowing destruction to take place and He will preserve them. See, in God's sovereignty, I've already said God is in control, God is in control, God is in control. But in His sovereignty, He actually gives you and I a great deal of power to determine our own destiny. It's like that pottery. It can be decorated. I believe God gives us certain ability to influence how He decorates us and and how He shapes us. He has the ultimate plan. He has the ultimate determination in His mind. But we can choose for the good or we can choose for the bad. See, by submitting to God and cooperating with God through repentance and brokenness and obedience, we choose blessings. If If you look at it this way, a repentant, cooperated, submitted spirit is like soft clay. If you will just stay humble before God, repentant as far as sin is concerned, obedient as far as the Word is concerned, loving as far as people are concerned, you're soft clay that God is just working with.
to, to mold. See, our actions and our prayers really do influence God's decisions about how He works in our lives. It really does matter. How you behave really does matter. Your prayers really do matter a lot with God. So God is sovereign, and yet He actually gives us a lot of power to determine how things are going to work out in our life. There's a lot of self-determination. God gives you a lot of autonomy. He lets you decide, red Corvette, green Corvette. You know, He does let you, He does give you, the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. So we have some cachet with God, okay? It's not just as rigid, rigid as what we think it is, but ultimately it is His plans and it is desires, and it is His shaping, and it is His molding. I can't explain it beyond that. It's a mystery. We just have to accept it. You are in the hands of God, but He does love you, and He does want you to be blessed, and He is listening to us as we pray. Now, I'm not going to, but if we were to read the, the, the rest of chapter 18, they chose bad. God gives us a choice. They chose bad. They chose to reject God. They chose to reject Jeremiah. And if you go to Jeremiah chapter 19, sometimes it's just faster to read the whole chapter instead of me sitting here trying to explain it and save time. And it actually is better because it's the Word of God. I have said this probably dozens of times. Most of my sermons are saturated with Scripture so that if, if what I say means nothing, you get the profound truth of God's Word into your heart. So, I'm just going to read chapter 19, and I'll read fast. This is what the Lord says to Jeremiah. Go buy a potter's clay jar. Take some of the elders of the city and some of the leading priests and go out to the valley of Hinnom near the entrance of the potsherd gate. Proclaim there the words of, that I speak to you. Say, hear the word of the Lord, kings of Judah and residents of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says. He says, I am going to bring such a disaster on this place that everybody who hears about it will shudder. Why? Because they've abandoned me and made this a foreign place. They have burned incense to other gods. They have burned incense in it to other gods that they, their fathers, and the kings of Judah have never known. They have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built high places to Baal on which to burn their children in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, something I never commanded or mentioned. I never entertained the thought. Jump to verse 10, Braden. He then says this to Jeremiah, because he talks about the terrible judgment they're going to take place. Shatter this jar in the presence of the people traveling with you and proclaim to them, this is what the Lord of hosts says, I will shatter these people in this city like one shatters a potter's jar that can never be mended. Jump to verse 14, Braden. And then it says, Jeremiah came back from Topeth where the Lord God had sent him to prophesy and stood in the courtyard of the Lord's temple and proclaimed to all the people, this is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel says, I'm about to bring on this city, on all, the depend, on all its dependent villages, all the disaster I spoke against it. For they have become obstinate, not obeying my words. I just want to say this. If I read that, you would shudder at the just tragedy of what's going to take place. Sometimes there is a point of no return where judgment is inevitable and unavoidable. It's going to happen. The Bible says this in Proverbs 29, verse 1. The Bible says... He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will be suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. So Jeremiah here is prophesying judgment in the very place where human sacrifices had taken place. The very site of where human sacrifice had taken place, he is prophesying. And the last part of verse 4 says, They have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. Has the United States filled this place? with the blood of the innocent through human sacrifice. This same valley here, Hinnom, in Hebrew is Gehenna in Greek, and Jesus refers to it as associated with hell in the New Testament. So these are judgments that are both temporary and eternal. He is saying, for those that are unrepentant, stiff-necked, stubborn-hearted, there is a judgment coming. And that clay is no longer moldable. It was a finished jar, and that smashing meant it was a permanent breaking. There's nothing he can do about it. It's done. Now, either the United States is here or teetering on the brink of going here. And I will tell you, a lot of times my opinion is, you know, whatever, this is everything. 
but I honest to God believe the United States, it's not, you know, if we're going to get judged. It's just how God is going to work the judgment out on the nation. And I told you before, I feel like Donald Trump was just a tourniquet. Tie that knot to see if the church is going to get its act together. We do not know what God is allowing, but I'm just saying on the basis of God's word, America must be judged for her sins. And some people don't like the word judgment. They say Jesus took it all at the cross. Read the end of the book. He's going to come back, and he is going to continue to execute judgments upon this earth. He does forgive us of our sins. You are not going to face the wrath of God. But again, sin is its own reward, and a nation can and will be judged for the sin it has allowed in its midst You know what that means? The only hope for America. Guys, I have waved the banner. We have prayed. We have interceded politically. We have done all of that because that's part of what we do. It's called good stewardship. It's part of what we do. But truthfully, baseline, the only hope for America is repentance. That is the only hope for our nation. The only hope for our nation is if this nation will repent. And God's mercy is to allow things to uh, unfold in such a way that He creates the most optimal opportunity for repentance as possible. So we just need to trust God. Who is the potter? Who is the clay? Whose hands are we in? We are in God's hands. That's a very comforting, very comforting place. He is shaping us into the vessels and the instruments that He wants us to be, and it's all according to His plan. Now, There are some elements in this story that are not mentioned, but they were very familiar with the process of turning clay into pottery. It would have been understood by the people. It would have been inferred in the story. There are two elements that are not mentioned in the scriptures here, but they're very much a part of the process of taking clay and creating a a, a pottery out of it. The first one is water, and the second one is what? Fire. Fire. And when he says in verse 2 that he had to go down to the potter's house, there is an inference that he had to go down to a water source because pottery, a potter needs lots of water to work with to put the elements together. So number one, you need a lot of water to mix with clay to make it soft and pliable. Who is the clay? So we need a lot of what? What does the scripture mention is water? Holy Spirit and the Word. The Bible says the Spirit is like water and the Word is like water. So we need a lot of the Spirit and a lot of the Word mixed into our lives if God is going to properly form us. If you want God to form you, you have to have a lot of the Spirit and a lot of the Word in your heart. The second thing here is a clay does not become a finished product. It does not become fit for use. That piece of clay, if you try to drink out of it or you put something hot in it, and it's still just form, what's it going to do? What has to happen to it? Has to have the fire to make it complete, right? This is what God is speaking to us. And it's called a kiln. When they would put it into the fire, they put it into a kiln. Well, you know, as I was meditating on this, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, they were just God's pottery in the fire being finished up. He just says, those are my little, those are my little uh, pots, those are my little boys, I'm just finishing them off in the fire. And it's just part of the Christian journey. We're going to have to go through the fire at some point or another. And you can't take an analogy and just make it stretch it too far. We go through constant iterations of going through the fire. And sometimes you have to put something in the fire more and more and more and glaze it and everything else. And I'm not going to try to bend this too much. But... If we're going to be finished off and completed and fit for use, we've got to go through the fire. 1 Peter 4.12, the Bible says this. 1 Peter 4.12, When the fiery ordeal arises among you to test you, don't be surprised by it if something unusual were happening to you. If If the clay could speak, you'd say, Hey, why am I going through the fire? Hey, knucklehead, it's part of the process, you would say to the clay. This is, you can't become who you're supposed to become unless you go through the fire. Doesn't this make Romans 8.28 make sense? This makes Romans 8.28 alive. 
I know that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, to those who are called according to His purpose. Because whose hands are we in? God's hands. So some things work together or all things work together? All things work together. Jesus went through the molding process Himself in His humanity. Luke 2.40, the Bible says this. In Luke 2.40, the boy Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. God's grace was on Him. Luke 2.52, the Bible says this. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with people. Hebrews 5.8, though, though a son, He learned obedience through what He suffered. So Jesus in His humanity had to go through this process of formation. He didn't skip the process at all. He went through it just like us. Jesus was saturated with water. He was saturated with the water of the Word. He was saturated with the water of the Spirit. He had to go through the furnace of affliction. This imagery, as I was sitting there and I was thinking, and God said, Oh, my son went through this process. I'm like, where? Where? It's Matthew 3 and 4. Jesus went through the process that He's talking about here. He was baptized in water, and He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. You remember His baptism. He wasn't doing ministry before baptism. Was He? Any theologians want to correct me? The Bible is silent. He wasn't doing ministry. He went in to the baptism of John the Baptist, saturated with what? Water. The water... And he, was, he was in the natural realm, the clay of his humanity, of his humanity was saturated with water, but also his soul was saturated with spiritual water. Water, first element. What's the second element? Fire. Where did he go after he was baptized? Into the desert, into the heat of the desert to face the fiery trials of Satan's temptation. God, the Son of God went through this process of the water mixed with the clay of His humanity, being fired in the furnace of affliction. And when Jesus came out of the process that we all have to go through, this is what the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. The Bible says this, After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed for him for a time. God reached him by the Spirit, pulled him out of the kiln of the desert. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about Him spread throughout the entire world vicinity. And he was teaching in their synagogues, being acclaimed by everybody. He came out of the fire, a vessel fitted for ministry. Jesus went through the process that he wants to bring all of us through. So I close with encouragement. Jeremiah 18, 3-4. The Bible says, Jeremiah went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working away at the wheel, but... The jar that he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hands. Flawed. So he made it into another jar as it seemed right for him to do. The Bible says that clay in his hands became flawed. So he made it into something else. This is one of the more powerful truths of Scripture. I, am, I want to speak to you. Listen to me. Who's, who's the clay? Whose hands are you in? What did he do with the clay? He reworked it. Did he toss the clay away? Did he say, oh, it's broken, it's flawed? Did he toss the clay away? He reworked it. See, God is not going to work with our sin or our compromise in our lives. That has to be removed. It has to be removed. It's a principle. He's not going to just say, I'm going to form it with this stone sticking out of the side of it, okay? He's not going to do that. It's, it's got to be it's got to be removed. And if we're not willing to remove it or allow it to be removed or cooperate with Him, listen to this. God allows the process of, of breaking and crushing to come. He allows the process. You're, you're stiff-necked, stubborn-hearted. You're, 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 you're resisting. He allows that process to come forth. Can you hear me okay? Is it getting... I'm going to shift. Okay. Let's just turn this bad boy off here. I was hearing a little bit of fuzz. Were you all hearing fuzz? I don't want to hear fuzz at the end of my message. Let's rework this thing a little bit here. So, 
God is not going to toss you away. God is not going to toss you aside. If you're not willing to submit to him, he will allow you to go through some processes. And a lot of Christians have experienced this process, okay? Sin is its own reward. We understand that? Sin is its own reward. God allows us to go down that wrong path many times because he gives you choice. He will say, okay, big boy, big girl, you want to keep going down that path? I will allow you to go down that path. But where does that path lead to? It leads to brokenness. Are you listening to me? That path will lead, and God will allow you to go down that path, but it leads to brokenness. It's almost like God takes his hands off, and he just allows this process to take place. But I am telling you, saints, there is beauty that arises from the ashes. Because instead of tossing that flawed piece piece of clay away, instead of tossing you away, God allows this brokenness to take place. And then what does he do as you're lying there in in your brokenness? He reaches down with his hands and he scoops up all the broken pieces of your life back into his hands and he begins to rework with you again. He allows that brokenness to take place, but like a mosaic coming forward, he scoops down and he takes that brokenness and he begins to mold it again. This is a beautiful picture of God's grace. He's not going to cast you aside. God is the God of second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth chances. Who is the clay? Who is the potter? Whose hands are you in? He's not going to cast you aside. He is the God of second chances. If you don't believe me, go look at King David. God is the God of second chances. If you don't believe me, Go to Jonah. God is the God of second chances. Go ask Peter. God is the God of second chances. In the story of the prodigal son, he says, okay, you were broken. Come home. I'll rework with you. I'll work with you again. See, in Hebrews 13, 5, the the Bible says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You cost too much for me to cast you aside. You're too valuable for me to throw you into the gutter. The Bible says this in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, and we are, we are, we're almost done. The Bible says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. Nobody is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. God says, I am going to stick with you to the end. And you know, you may not like that. To to a lot of people here, that's such a blessing. But somebody living in sin, that's kind of annoying. God, I wish you would just kind of go away. I can't enjoy my sin. That's what he's doing. It's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want you to enjoy your sin because it always leads to brokenness. See, the bottom line here is God is going to continue working in our lives, molding and making us to the very end. His hands are always going to be involved in our lives. Whatever's happening in our life, whatever is happening in your life, whatever is happening in your life, we need to trust God and we need to cooperate with him because he is the potter. We are the clay. We are his workmanship. We're in his hands. And I hope that we find peace and rest and just, just hope in this truth that God has presented to us today. I'm, I'm going to close, and we're going to close with a song. And, you know, if we need to pray, we will. I've gone longer than what I normally like to go. I just felt like this is a special message for today. I'll just read this. At the turn of the century, a woman from Iowa, Adelaide Pollard, deeply desired to go to Africa as a missionary. For years, she tried to raise money to go to Africa, but her efforts failed. Finally, she reached her mid-40s, and at the turn of the century, you know, that's considered middle age at the turn of the century, she realized that she would never reach Africa. The poor woman felt confused and disappointed that God had not opened a way for her to become a missionary. And one night, she attended a prayer meeting, and she heard an elderly woman pray these words, It's all right, Lord. 
It doesn't matter what you bring in our lives. Just have your own way with us. Later that evening, Paul had wrote the words to the beloved hymn, Have Thine Own Way. You know this, Have Thine Own Way, Lord? It goes on to say, she eventually wrote more than 100 hymns and became so well known for her music that God began to open doors of ministry for her, doors that his providence had previously kept closed. And in God's timing, this dear servant of Christ traveled all over the United States, Great Britain, and guess where she also traveled to? Africa. Have thine own way, Lord. Come, why don't we just stand real quick? I am going to... Um, I'll, I'll be willing to pray with anybody that wants to pray. I, I hope that today you, you recognize that God loves you. And, and if you've made mistakes, he's forgiven you. The only thing God is asking from you, you've made mistakes, confess your mistakes and repent. The only thing God doesn't want is for you to resist. He doesn't want you to resist. If he's, if, just confess and move on, right? Right?